Welcome to the Old Man of the Three Things with J.J. Reddick and the Dunker Spot. Mondays, Mondays, Mondays. I love this show. I love having you guys on. I love that Nikias is wearing a Philadelphia Eagles shirt today. Big night. Super Bowl rematch. Unfortunately, this is not a football show. But I will say, fly, Eagles, fly. Let's go. Let's go. Tonight's the night. <laughs> Tonight's the night. I love it. <laughs> All right, we're going to do something uh, slightly different. Uh, not going to have necessarily a, a full three things. We may have a lot more things because we're going to talk about a number of teams today. I feel like in both sides of the conferences, there were a number of teams that were struggling that we had some question marks about early on. And those teams have played particularly good basketball over the last 10 days or so. And I want to focus on those teams. Uh, I want to start in the Eastern Conference. Uh, before I get to one of the teams we're going to focus on, though, I just want to say the Boston Celtics are really good. Uh, they now have won six in a row. Uh, this stat has been circulating all over NBA Twitter, but I want to repeat it here. The Boston starters, obviously the most used lineup for the Boston Celtics this season, uh, have an offensive rating of 124.1 and a defensive rating of 95.7 for a net rating of 28.4. That's pretty fucking damn good. Tied with the Magic for number one defensive league and a top five offense, number four in offense. Uh, they're really good. Uh, the other team that we both, we all thought would be awesome this season is the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, they are now nine and four. They've won four in a row. Uh, for you guys, what are you seeing from them uh, over the last week or so? What has got you excited? What has got you concerned? I think the excitement level for me, I think, starts with the defense. Nice to see them simplifying things. Nice to see Brooke in a deeper drop now. And you see the percentage of shots that they're allowing at the rim has gone up since that start where they're playing more aggressively. But while that's gone from like first to 10th, they're now allowing a ridiculously low field goal percentage at the rim now since you have Brooke and you have Giannis back there more often. So I think that's helped them get out and transition a little bit more. That's made it a little bit easier for them to go offensively. And the second thing I'll mention before I toss it to Steve is just the comfort level of Dame. He seems to feel a little bit more comfortable. And I think there were comments made about three games ago about Dame asking to change his rotation pattern to where instead of coming out after the first seven or eight minutes and then have an extended break, come back in midway through the second, he's now playing all of the first quarter and all of the third quarter. And I think you're starting to see him gather a rhythm offensively a little bit more in addition to him just gaining a little bit more comfort with Giannis, with Brooke Lopez and some of the bigs and looking a little bit better there. Uh, the biggest thing for me to bounce off Nikias' defense point, it's not just that they've added the drop for Brooke. It's that they're starting to find the blend defensively a little bit more. If you watch them now, after that first set or that first action, there's more help. There's more activity. They're recovering better. Bobby Portis will come in and switch or be at the level. You can combine that with what Brooke does. There's a better feeling defensively. Obviously, you get stops. You can go out and run. It looks a heck of a lot better when Damian Lillard is making shots. You see them sprinkling in more Dame and Giannis two-man game, not just side pick and roll, but also a little bit of pass and cut. Let him, let Dame get downhill. Let him lead the dance a little bit. Malik Beasley's been making shots. Everyone just kind of feels a little bit more comfortable and in their roles. And I think they're starting to understand the, the flow of what they want to do, not just in the regular season, but just kind of grow towards the playoffs. Yeah, I like that uh, high chase action they're running with Dame and Giannis um, because it allows Dame to get to his right hand. Defense can't necessarily set. Again, it's on the move. It functions essentially as a pick and roll. Um, I always tell the story playing Bradley Beal in the fourth quarter of a game in 2014, and they would zipper him to the top, and they'd be in a horn set, and he'd throw to Nene, and then you got to deal with him cutting off the ball and Nene screening. And I was like, oh shit, that's hard to guard. And I went to Blake and I was like, we, we need to start doing this. Went to DJ, I was like, we need to start doing this. And now, you know, if you can run a functional two-man game, you find two guys who are willing to play that action. It's incredibly difficult, difficult to guard because it doesn't, it doesn't set up the same way as a traditional dribble handoff. It doesn't set up the same way as a traditional pick and roll, but it functions in the same way. And I like when they're doing that with Dame. One thing on Milwaukee, I... And again, I, I, I didn't have time this morning, but it just struck me. I'm thinking this is league-wide because of the in-season tournament and the fact that every Friday and every Tuesday you're playing someone in your conference. So I would assume the schedule is sort of set up this way. I'd have to look across the league. But their win the other night against Dallas was their first game against a Western Conference op opponent. Uh, they have a home game Sunday against Portland. Uh, they go to Texas 
uh, on 1217, 1219. Then they go back to Texas on January 4th and January 6th. They don't have a true West Coast road trip until January 29th. It's a lot of Eastern Conference teams that they play here in the first half of the season. Again, I did not check all tw- the other 29 teams on that, but I found that really interesting that they're not going to they're not going to face uh you know a, a heavy dose of the Nuggets and the Suns and the Lakers and the War and all these all the Warriors, OKC, Timberwolves, all these all these teams that you know we all can agree have a shot there in the Western Conference. Anyways, tangent, thought it was interesting. Um another team that you guys love particularly Nikias, and that is the Miami Heat. Um, where do they stand right now in, in terms of your overall level of comfort declaring that they are going to be in the mix again for the Eastern Conference Championship? Uh, I think they're firmly a good team. I think zooming out, they're probably tier two or tier 2.5, depending on how you feel about the half-court offense. Um, they've had some fun stretches as of late. That Chicago loss over the weekend was a funny one. But either, either way, even with that, they've won seven of their last days. So depending on how you feel about the offense, they're probably two tier two or tier two and a half. I feel pretty good about them. I think this is a pretty deep roster. And as they get healthier and gain more cohesion, I think they're going to be even better. I don't have major concerns with them right now. It's all about fit for me. I, I'm not one to doubt the Miami Heat. Uh, it's going to depend on matchups. But for me, can they get their defense in the right place over the course of the regular season where we can defend you man to man? We can go with zone offensively you could question you can have question marks about the half court offense but they are going to run what they run and they believe in what they do duncan robinson has grown into someone who is just rejecting pick and rolls and making plays off the bounce uh we always have the jimmy butler is he going to shoot factor is he going to drive and get to the free throw line factor bam out of bios taking another leap offensively so to me this is a team that's set up and slotted with guys like jaime jaquez and Josh Richardson, Kyle Lowry, Haywood Highsmith, who fit what they want to do. And it's just, can they find enough offensively? Can they up the tempo? And then defensively, can they get to that heat style of defense where we're going to compete every single night and make it tough? But I, I would not count them out. Yeah. Um, had my doubts coming into the season. Um, I'm pretty high on the Miami Heat. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Tyler Hero uh, out with a grade two ankle injury. I think it was about 11, 10, 11 days ago that he, he sprained his ankle. But he's been awesome. Uh, in the eight games that he played, uh, career high in points, assists, three-point percentage. Duncan, as you mentioned, all of a sudden becoming a better version of Duncan Robinson. I did not see that coming. I'm, look, he had some moments in the playoffs last year uh, that that stretched to begin the game, uh, to begin the fourth quarter uh, in the game that they won against the Denver Nuggets in the finals. Um, had some stretches in, in that Boston uh, uh, series. His it's not even that his confidence is back. It's that uh, he's almost a different player. When you talk about like he was always good at getting layups and getting to the rim off cuts, right? You overplay him, he's going to cut. Bam, as a passer, Jimmy as a passer, they're going to find him. Uh, the off the dribble moxie and the sauce from Duncan Robinson is just unexpected. It's unexpected, and all of a sudden coming into the season, wherever you kind of had him as a player. Well, he's exceeded that. That that adds a, a, I think, a different element to their team. Bam, the aggressiveness has really stood out. He's averaging a career high in field goal attempts per game. I know that's a that's a very simple stat, but the fact that Bam night to night is taking this amount of shots and they're they're running offense through him consistently. It's something that we've talked about for the last two years. I feel like oh, we need more Bam. We need more Bam. And all of a sudden now he's having a career year. So I, I think the the internal improvement uh, plus the fit of the the role players you mentioned, uh, I, I think makes them a, a super tough team. And they're going to be right in the mix come playoff time. Uh, what has stood out for you, both of you guys? Because I know you're big fans of him. What has stood out for both of you guys with, with Hawkes? Oh, man, I just love his feel. Like, he just knows how to fill gaps when he's off the ball. You're still trying to figure out where exactly the shot is going to normalize for him. And I think as you zoom ahead with this Miami team, if they get to the playoffs, that's going to be the big swing for him. Defensively, a very patient defender. Like, he doesn't get too antsy when he's defending really good players in space. Like, even looking at the end of the Chicago game, DeMar DeRozan hits a tough shot over him. But, like, it's not like DeMar baked him, 
or anything like that. He's really good at mirroring in space. So I appreciate the defense there, um, how he's able to mirror guys in space, the switchability. When they do go zone, he seems to know where he wants to be. And offensively, has a nice little mid-post game. So if you try to stash your fourth or best def- fifth or best defender on him, he can take him down to the block and generate a good shot for you. If there is an advantage created from someone else, he knows when to shoot, when to cut, when to drive and keep things moving. He just knows how to play basketball, as simple as that is. It's very simple. He's a basketball player, perfect for this basketball team. And the fact that he can do some cutting, do some driving, uh, the post-ups, I love that they lean into his post game. Defensively, he's just got good positioning. He just fits what Miami wants to do. And for him to play so well to where my only question mark is, hey, is, is it just going to be catch and shoot? Is that the only thing he's missing right now? I feel like that's a big win for him and Miami. Yeah. I, my big takeaway from all of this, can we start drafting more field players? Can we just start doing that? And I get the philosophy around the draft that you're drafting for, for potential, you're drafting for a higher ceiling and all that stuff. I think particularly with a team that's drafting later in the first round and is in the mix as a contender, right? Obviously the heat coming off a of finals appearance, definitely a, a full blown contender. I'm always fascinated when these guys end up later in the second round or later in the first round. And you're like, God, that, that guy would have been such a good fit on your team. I'm watching, I'm watching Desmond Bain last night with Memphis. And I'm like, I, I get it. He had a negative wingspan, but the fucker could play. It's obvious. Can we start drafting more guys who are smart, intelligent, competitive, feel basketball players? Please, please. Hashtag draft good basketball players. God. I care what the fucking measurements are. <laughs> All right. Uh, a, a team that I, I watched the Cleveland Denver game last night. One of the games that I watched and obviously no Jamal Murray. Mitchell out of the lineup. Really impressed with Cleveland. I think the one thing that has stood out for me uh, in all the games that I've watched and uh, also just in all the spreadsheets that I've looked at, because we always talked about <laughs> Cleveland being a spreadsheet championship contender last year. Uh, Max Struess has been like the perfect fit for this team. Um, right now, he's got a 7.3 net rating. They're winning his minutes by a lot. And it was that fifth guy, that fifth guy. Who's going to be the fifth guy? Levert's not the perfect fit for Garland and Mitchell is the fifth guy. Um, you know, you you go back to all of the deep runs that Miami made in the playoffs and Struess was a guy that oftentimes got targeted more than held his own, more than held his own defensively. And so you're not, you have the shooting, you have the off ball movement, uh, his playmaking, particularly with Mobley in the two man game has been excellent this year. So to me, this has been the perfect fit. I know their record's not great. Uh, they're up to three wins in a row right now. Um, they're, they're not like blowing you out of the water with the advanced metri- metrics like they were last year. But over the course of this season, as as they get healthy and and, and those five guys start playing together more, the five starters, um, I love this fit. And, and I'm also very high on Cleveland. Uh, what have you guys seen from them? What have you guys seen from Struess that gets you excited? I think for me, I'm... Talked about this a little bit last week. I've been kind of in a holding pattern with Cleveland just because of Jared Allen missing time, Darius Garland missing time. And so we got to see what Donovan Mitchell looks like, again, with super high usage. He's had a really good start to the season. Evan Mobley, it's felt up and down offensively, and then you look at his numbers, it's like, oh, well, he's still averaging like 16 and 11. That's cool. The defense is still very good. And so it's been nice to kind of get an early look at what do some of the Mitchell-Mobley lineups look like with the bench or some of the other pieces. Because I think as you get the full team together, you're going to need to mix and match some of those rotations and some of those lineups. And so getting the early look, while it wasn't super ideal to build that full five-man chemistry, it did serve as kind of like a learning tool for me. Um, and so even within that, like tracking what Evan Mobley does on the short roll has been something that I've been keeping an eye on. That's felt up and down, but I do believe that he's ultimately going to get there. Like he just seems to be, you know, to your high field point, he seems to have too good a field to not figure that out eventually. So that part's been fun. You nailed everything I want to say on Max Struess. Like, I, you know, watching him in Miami and watching him carve out a role there, it felt like someone that you could kind of plug and play just about anywhere. Um, figure out where, again, the shot was going to normalize, going to be interesting just because of how things fell apart for him in the postseason. But that certainly perked up. The playmaking continuing to pop has been a really fun development in Cleveland. Um, so it's it's been an interesting team to track, but I, I think they're going to be really good as they continue to be healthy. 
Uh, I think it's been an important stretch. You you miss Garland for a little bit. You miss Allen for a little bit. You miss Mitchell for a little bit. You're starting to find your way. To add to the Struce point, I like what he brings to their offense just as far as movement goes. It gives a little bit more purpose and zip to some of the things that they run. They've had good movement sets. It just sometimes takes them forever to get into it. But you add him in as a different layer in actions with Mitchell, with Garland. It opens things up. I'm keeping an eye on Jared Allen. He feels more aggressive when he's looking to roll as far as trying to finish, trying to mix in a little float shot. So I want to see how that grows throughout the season because of what happened to him in the playoffs and how teams are likely going to defend him in the playoffs. But I just think having Struess, having George Niang, I think just adds more balance to being able to have more shooting on the floor at more times. Karis LeVert can now, hey, you go to the bench, you do what you do, keep doing it. If you do well, you'll just finish the game. Other than that, you just stay in your role. So I think Cleveland is starting to find their rhythm uh, at an important time. You guys talked about what happened in the playoffs last year. Let's bring up the New York Knicks. Knicks fans always get mad because I never talk about them on the podcast. Well, we're going to talk about the New York Knicks. Um, Dante DiVincenzo uh, against Charlotte gets to start as a career night. Uh, love seeing that. Um, the one thing I want to say specific, well, there's two things I, I want to bring up about the Knicks that have uh, really stood out for me. Uh, number one, um, I, I called, I believe, their fifth or sixth game of the season, which was the start of the in-season tournament at Milwaukee. And up to that point, and including that game, uh, Julius Randle uh, was not good. He was not a good basketball player to start the season. Let's be very clear on that. Um, and RJ and I have talked about the, a bunch about this, like the sample size thing. I think we mentioned it last last week on the show. I think sample size is so important. Like we can't, we can't just overreact to the start of a season. Julius Randle's coming off surgery and, you know, over his last seven, 24 game, nine rebounds, six assists, 45% from the field, starting to look more like the all NBA, the all-star Julius Randle. There's a lot of, a lot of basketball to be played. A lot of basketball. I, I, you know, I, 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 I talk about, Oh, this guy's averaging a career high in three point percentage. Yeah, but I, I expect it to normalize, right? When I when I when I bring that stuff up, like typically, stuff normalizes over the course of an eighty two game season. If a guy's an All NBA talent, he's probably going to have stretches of the season where he looks like an All NBA talent. Okay, and we can get mad at the start of the season, Knicks fans. I understand your frustration. I certainly do. I had to watch those games too. I did. I was frustrated, but Julius Randle is a hell of a basketball player. Okay. Second thing, uh, Mitchell Robinson is a fucking monster on the offensive glass. He's a monster. Six offensive rebounds a game. This team, it, it, it's, it's interesting. You watch them play and you're like, man, I don't know how much more of this I can watch. It's not pretty basketball. It's not. They're number five in defense. They're number 10 in offense. Number one rebounding team in the league. Number one defensive rebounding team in the league. Number two offensive rebounding the team in the league. Like there's a there's an identity. There's an identity with this team. And I think the big thing for me, even going back to last year's playoffs, last year's regular season, the big thing for me is can they make enough threes? Can they make enough threes? That all of a sudden turns them into a real, really, really, really good basketball team. I'm very glad that you got the Mitchell Robinson note in there because if you weren't, I was going to get there. He has been <laughs> incredible to start this season. You mentioned the offensive rebounds, and it's kind of a similar formula to what we saw from the Knicks last year, right? Where they didn't take a bunch of threes. It wasn't like they were just high-flying offense or anything like that. But you get that many cracks at it in terms of extra possessions, you're going to put some points on the board. And the fact that they still don't turn the ball over all that much means you're going to get cracks at it. And so just having him as part of your formula, I think, has been pretty important for them. And then defensively, I floated it out there already. Like, I think he's putting together an all-defense campaign. I don't know if he ends up making it just because there are a lot of fun defensive seasons happening in the league so far, but he has been an absolute monster on the interior again. And he was really good last year and he feels so much better on the perimeter. Like I was watching that Charlotte game and there was a possession. Charlotte goes pick and pop with PJ Washington and Mitchell Robinson's a little bit late getting back to it. PJ tries to drive. He's able to contain that drive without fouling and it ends up being a turnover going the other way. And it's like, that is not a play he would have been able to make two years ago. That is very much a Mitchell Robinson just picked up his fourth foul and he's probably done for the night type situation. So seeing that growth on the perimeter in combination with how he's shutting down the paint on the defensive end, 
in addition to what he's doing on the offensive end, just creating a whole bunch of extra chances for this New York team, he's been incredibly fun for me to watch. Also, glad R.J. Barrett is back. Migraines freaking suck. And so I am just glad, I was just glad to see him back on the court, and he's been really good this year as well. Well, I, I will say to add to JJ's point about the threes, it's not just that they're making them. They look great when they do. How are they generating them? Because there are two mixed teams. One where they are in the mud and it just looks gross and slow, and the <laughs> other when they are making quick decisions and moving the ball. And that's the point I want to keep hammering home about Julius Randle because I know some of the step backs are very loud. He's got more pick and roll users this year. But when he is making quick decisions and he is looking to pass the ball, he is creating plays for this Knicks offense. And I would just say keep an eye on it. There's a play against Washington. This man brought the ball up the court, swung it ahead, popped, drove immediately, did a handoff, got it back, popped, drove again. And I'm like, hey, he's doing some good things. Let's just keep an eye on that. R.J. Barrett's more decisive. I think the lineup functionality, being able to have Josh Hart and Dante DiVincenzo, who can guard multiple positions, space the floor for you. And I think Jalen Brunson, the, the better he plays, the more in command that he is, the tougher they are to deal with. And so it's just, can they keep that up offensively to where that movement is there? Or are we going to get the, everyone has shot a step back in the last four possessions? <laughs> yes. Let's not revert back to that, New York Knicks. Let's not revert back to that way of playing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, on the three point shooting, you know, I, I should. You guys mentioned RJ off to a hard start from three. Jalen Brunson off to a hard start from three. Uh, you know, can can DiVincenzo, can Quentin Grimes, uh, Josh Hart, can all those guys uh, make enough threes? I think I think Julius Randall is going to take threes. Uh, I don't know that he's going to, you know, necessarily shoot forty to forty two percent. But you're certainly getting some offense if he's, you know, some efficient offense if he's thirty five, thirty six percent. Uh, for the season from three. Uh, but that's that's the big thing for the, me with them offensively. Uh, you know, they're going to create extra possessions because they crash the glass because Mitchell Robinson's so good at getting offensive boards and and doing that. Uh, but I, I think you, you you start playing the, the, the Bostons, you start playing the Milwaukee's, like you're going to need to generate offense from the three-point line. Um, Western Conference, real quick. The four teams I want to talk about are the Oklahoma City Thunder, They've won five in a row. They're now up to second place. Sacramento Kings. De'Aaron Fox is back. Clearly back. Uh, the Lakers and the Phoenix Suns. Um, real quick on OKC. I assume you guys watched that Golden State game the other night. Um, one of the best early season basketball games I think we've had so far this year. You know, with, with Chet specifically, what has jumped out to you about his play on both ends of the floor, I should mention. Um, I think he's, I think he's in the top ten. Uh, the EPM numbers are out. Mm -hmm. they, the first batch of EPM numbers are out. I think he's in the top ten in EPM on both offense and defense. Uh, not many players in the league uh, in in both categories, and and he's he's there. I think for me with Chet, it has been the comfort with the ball. I think this is something that Steve and I talked about watching him as a driver. He looks super comfortable grabbing and going. And even if it's just like them going into delay action or if it's a pick and pop for him, he legitimately has the threat of knocking down an above the break three or taking it all the way to the basket without risk of fumbling it. So I think just the comfort he has with the ball in his hands is really popped for me. And then defensively, like he's just not scared of anyone. Like you may try to post him up, you may move him with a couple of bumps, but he's going to be right there to challenge your shot. And I think just having that layer of rim protection and even when OKC ramps things up, having someone like Chet that can clean things up on the back end has been a real boon for their defense. I don't know if he's a top 10 player in the league, like EPM suggests, but he has been legitimately very impactful on both ends. It's been a lot of fun to watch him. He's got a great feel on both ends of the floor. You mentioned the defense. I've been impressed by the positioning, whether he's on or off ball, he's able to communicate. He's able to be in the right spot. He does his job pretty consistently as they alter their game plan. That's the kind of stuff you want to see from a young player. Offensively, you can start to see not just the confidence grow. I believe JJ, you had a certain word for him last time we talked about him. But he's starting to mix things up to where, hey, there's a sequence where he's going to go ahead and pick and pop, hit a three. Cool. Now I'm a trail big. I'm going to drive right at you and finish. And now you have to deal with that blend in that offense, which has spacing, which has cutting, which has driving that he fits right into. So there's no real one thing that you can take away from at the moment because he's kind of moving all over the place. And so I've just been impressed by him continuing to build game after game. 
My biggest concern with OKC coming into this season uh, was their shooting, to be honest with you. And uh, they, they're number one in the league in three-point percentage right now. Now, they don't, they don't take a lot. They're number 24 in attempts. But they're number one in the league in three-point percentage. Lou Dort shooting the ball uh, at 45%. Isaiah Joe has had a couple <laughs> insane shooting games recently. He's at 47.2%. Chet's at 46%. Um, so if they're, if they're efficient from beyond the arc, we know Shea's going to get to the free throw line. Like they're going to create enough good offense. They're in the top 10 in both offense and defense. The, the feel point about Chet, I, I think is huge. Um, and, and just how their offense functions. Uh, I had a college coach call me, uh, on Friday. Uh, he had some questions. He, he sent me some clips and he's talking about, uh, you know, we, we're always playing four, four guys that can space and one non-spacer, one non-shooter. And I said to him, hey, do me a favor. Go watch OKC's offense. Like, literally, just go back last year, the year before. Um, because they're, they're, a lot of times, they, you know, Chet now, I think, gives them a different dynamic, particularly at that position. But a lot of times, they're playing with two or three, sometimes, non-shooters. And they just do a great job of maintaining spacing, getting into their driving kick game, getting the ball into the paint. And Giddy, Shea, they're just relentless. Jalen Williams, relentless at just the redrive, redrive, redrive. And eventually, you get to the basket, you create a foul, you create an open shot uh, where it's not the, – the, the type of threes they take is very different, I think, from some of the other teams. Um, so just been super impressed with them. I wanted to bring up Sack. I, I, I know I'm going to ask you guys about De'Aaron Fox, but Herter's the other guy that, uh, you know, I wanted to bring up when I was talking about Julius Randle because I think there was a there was an overreaction, not even just from fans, but, you know, Mike Brown wanted to bring uh, Chris Duarte off the bench or off the bench and into the starting lineup, bring Herter off the bench. Um, I think the fit with Herter and, and in all the Sabonis uh, hub activity uh, is so good. And he got off to a slow start, and I think there was an overreaction. Kevin Herter, over his last six games played, averaging 19 a game, shooting 47% from three on 8.5 attempts. Like, let's not overreact, right? These are good basketball players. Like, I, I see all the fucking Monstar shit, you know, the Monstar. They, they, they stole his powers about this guy or that guy. It's like, yeah, like, beginning of the season, some guys get off to slow starts. It just happens, all right? There's a rhythm. Just getting in shape. There's all that stuff. Getting your leg. Dame's talked about it a bunch. Getting your legs underneath you. So let's not overreact. How good is De'Aaron Fox, though? <laughs> He's so fucking good. <laughs> He's incredible. Uh, and I, I didn't mean to go first, Nikaias, but the, the way that he's playing, I'm going to go quick. It, it, he's going to be able to make shots from three at this level, combined with his speed that he has, combined with the control and the command that he has, as far as picking and choosing his spots, knowing when to change speeds, it's hard. You don't know if that hesitation is going to be him hitting the turbo button and going all the way. You don't know if he's going to tap that space and go to a pull-up. You don't know if he's going to step back and hit a three. You have all the pass and cut actions that they play with, and he's willing to give that ball up knowing it's going to come back. He's just in. He's dialed in. He's, com he's in command of his game, and you can see what it's done for Sacramento over the stretch. Dude, just the willingness for him to take threes. Like, it's very, it's very much shifting from, okay, cool, De'Aaron's shooting. We ain't got to get worried about him going into the paint, into, holy crap, he's doing this too. And now I don't know what we're supposed to do with this dude. Because as you mentioned, Steve, like, him being able to change speeds the way that he is, like, you just can't defend him one-on-one. -on -one. And you think about the level of spacing that Sacramento has around him, it's not like you can really afford to trap him. One, he may just be fast enough to outdrive your trap anyway, and then you're really in rotation. But if you do, he's very good at getting off the ball. If it's him and Sabonis, Sabonis can make plays in open space, which very quietly, Sabonis still having a very good season. I think that should be of note as well. But there isn't a real answer for De'Aaron Fox. If he's shooting like this, in addition to what he does as a driver, and then, you know, late in games, he can also just press into your jersey and shut you down at the point of attack, too. I don't know what you do with him. I'm having a whole lot of fun watching De'Aaron Fox. I had three or four conversations when they were struggling, and they had some bad losses. They had some bad losses, and and... People were like, oh, man, the Kings, they're, they're regressing. They're, they're this, they're that. Or, hear me out, Darren Fox is hurt. <laughs> I think he may matter in all of this. I think he may matter. Uh, Sabonis over his last four, 28, 13, and seven and a half. Not bad. Um, I want to run through this real quick. Lakers, uh, quickly, I just want to mention, 
the LeBron James is awesome in year 21. Literally, we've never seen this before. Um, I think two things that stand out to me is just the efficiency. Uh, you know, career high in field goal percentage. He's shooting 39.7% from three on over five attempts. Uh, and they're winning his minutes by a lot. And if you go through some of those bench lineups, not good. Uh, some of the shooting numbers from some guys, not good. Uh, he's having to probably carry uh, a, a bigger, a bigger sort of uh, load than I think we we anticipated going into the season. Like I, I knew that LeBron was going to have to be a version of LeBron uh, for this team to be good, but. Uh, so far, it's like he's exceeded and everybody, for the most part, not everybody, but a, a lot of guys have sort of underperformed. Is that is that the sense you guys are getting right now? Yeah, it's been kind of weird. Like, I think you have D'Lo, you have Austin Reeves coming off to the postseason, and off the, just off the year that he's had. You expect them to be able to carry more regular season usage, and then LeBron can kind of pick his spots, and then you can serve him for the playoffs, and then LeBron becomes LeBron again. And so far, like, it's been an up-and-down season for D'Lo, though he's starting to perk up as of late. Austin Reeves just really hasn't found it consistently yet. Uh, I would imagine both of those two find, establish some kind of rhythm, and then LeBron could take a little bit more of a backseat offensively. But I'm kind of with you, JJ. I'm really just marveling at what LeBron's doing. Like the efficiency, you can post him up and still just get a good look every time down. And that's just not supposed to be the case in year 21. Space to disagree, and especially with some of the players that they brought in to shoot, not shooting particularly well right now. But you still can't afford to send early help to LeBron because he just dices you up as a passer. And he's still just stronger than 98% of the NBA. So if you don't send that help, he's bullying his way to the rim. And it's nice to see his jumper perk back up as well. But I, I think we're going to see the guards perk up at some point. Like, I think the process generally has been sound for LA. It has been missed shots. It has been a little bit of underperformance for the guards. So I would imagine that that gets better. And then we'll see a more balance across this team. Uh, LeBron's been incredible. My eyes are wondering, how do they balance Nikaias had mentioned the process. It, it looked like it would be nice to have some more playmaking, some more shooting, so you can kind of integrate more stuff. Can you lean on that more? Or are you going to lean more into LeBron and Anthony Davis? Uh, but it's it's tough when those guys just aren't making shots. Is Austin Reeves going to get back to playmaking? Uh, are they going to find the right combinations? Torian Prince, very aggressive. I like the fit. Has not made shots. Gabe Benson wasn't making shots. Cam Reddish is working hard defensively, but he's also not making shots. So it's just... It feels like they're this this close, and so can LeBron now help them kind of get back to that point where, all right, we can kind of get our blend going again. It doesn't just have to be me. Agree with all that. Uh, real quick, uh, Phoenix Suns uh, have won three in a row. They just won two games back-to-back uh, -back in Utah. I had the game on Friday. Great game. Um, Durant's playing <laughs> incredible. Uh, Booker's back, playing incredible. Uh, I want to ask you guys a little bit about uh, his playmaking and just this whole conversation about them having a non-traditional point, point guard. Because I brought this up on the broadcast. I'm like, what is a traditional point guard now? Like, wh what team plays with a Thank traditional point guard? Thank you! Like, it just, it's, uh, it's, uh, can we stop? It's 2023. Can we stop? It's not a thing anymore. Mark Jackson is not a thing anymore. All right? Sorry. It's not. All right. Uh, the thing I want to bring up on Phoenix, hard to judge because they really haven't been whole. And they, and again, I'm not going to judge them once they are whole and, and Bradley Beal's back in the line. I'm not going to judge them on five games. You know, I want to, I want to see this team healthy and playing together for 20, 25 games. Defense is a concern, particularly with the uh, rim protection. Uh, I think Eubanks, uh, you know, has had really good minutes. Um, a little concern with, with Nurkic, but I think on the offensive end, you need him in the short role. You need his playmaking. Uh, he's not had a good start to the season. The one positive, not the one positive, there's a lot of positives. The one thing that has really stood out for me, and this was true even last year, but it's why I'm particularly excited once Bradley Beal's back in the lineup. In all their sets, whether it's a, let's say, a Spain pick and roll, a Kevin Durant ISO, uh, they do such a good job with their spacing of who the next guy is. I brought this up with Will Hardy on the broadcast. We get to sometimes interview the coaches at the beginning of the third quarter. We each get a quick question. But if you watch Devin Booker and ISO, Kevin Durant and ISO, if those two guys are on the court together, the next guy 
is always Kevin Durant or Devin Booker. They're passing to each other, which allows them to have open threes, to attack a closeout in rotation. Um, even last night, you know, late Booker got an ISO uh, at the top. They doubled. Next guy was Grayson Allen. Kevin Durant's in the corner. Well, now you have no good answer to that. They swing to Grayson Allen. Guy in the corner doesn't want to rotate off Kevin Durant. Grayson Allen hits a wide open three. They're spacing. Let's say it's a Spain action. We know they're forcing left. Uh, we've got Kevin Durant or Grayson Allen in the corner. So if they do tag with the low man, that's that's the bailout for Devin Booker. Like, it's not complicated, but it's it's smart. It's it, it, and, it, and they're and they're really good. They're 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 on point almost every single possession with who that next guy is. And again, all of a sudden in three weeks, four weeks, whenever it is, that next guy could be Bradley Beal. And then the next guy after him in rotation is Devin Booker. And the next guy after him is Grayson Allen. So I think offensively, uh, this team is going to be elite once they have all these, uh, all their, all their pieces whole and, and, and they're, they're healthy. Like one of the early questions I had heading into the season is just what is this team going to look like under Frank Vogel versus Monty Williams? Not to denigrate Frank Vogel at all. It's just a literal, I have no idea what he's going to try to implement. Is it just going to be tweaking what they're already doing since they already have most of the quarterback? I just didn't know what it's going to look like. So them nailing the spacing early on, I think has been even more important in light of Bradley Beal being out. Simplifying things for the stars. We're going to find a way to generate two to the ball consistently, or we're just going to get efficient looks whenever we give the ball to our stars. So being able to nail that, I think has been important. To your very early Devin Booker point, he is nailing every read you need him to as a primary ball handler. And I feel like that's been such a kind of like a slow burn from his rookie year when Phoenix just wasn't very good and they put the ball in his hands very early on. You fast forward to like the Ricky Rubio slash Chris Paul era and teams are trapping him and seeing what Devin Booker's going to do and how he's going to react to that. Now you just can't even really afford to trap him anymore because he gets rid of it so early or he's able to string it out and find other guys. And to your point again about the spacing, it's really hard to do that in general because of who you have next to Devin Booker. So like it's been fun watching the bet off of that. And because of how the offense is structured right now, and considering Bradley Bill's going to be back at some point, I have less concern about the defense or more, I guess more like I don't need the defense to be top 10. If the offense is going to be this right now and it should be even better now, like I think it lowers the margin of error for them defensively a little bit. Uh, maybe I'm just kidding. So like that's, that's made me feel a little bit better about it as they're working through some of this stuff. Uh, to, the Kev, uh, to the Booker, Kevin Durant point, I think it's the discomfort that you have defending them one-on-one -on -one that continues to open things up and allows you to put them one pass away from each other on some of these ISOs. I love the way that they use them in pick and roll together. And I think with Bradley Beal, to add to your point, you're always going to have someone on the court that you probably don't want to card Kevin Durant. And that's going to open up double teams. It's not just the passing that they have and the spacing they have. Watch the cutting from the Phoenix Suns on the weak side. They do a great job of timing their cuts to alter your rotations and to continue to open things up. And so I think the positives for them early are we have had a lot of guys who've had to play more minutes, so we know we have more options as the fifth person. And boy, we are finding some things spacing-wise to where you now have to deal with not just KD and Booker, but also Bradley Beal. I think that's going to serve them long-term, even if the the record may not be exactly where you want it to be now. That's a great point on the cuts because that does alter your rotations. Um, you know, as as guys sink and fill, uh, when you do have those weak side cuts, it, it creates a sometimes a longer rotation, which then creates a longer second rotation uh, as the ball gets and swings to the weak side. Uh, guys, we're going to wrap. Before we wrap, I, I actually just want to uh, repeat something that we said on the broadcast that Frank Vogel said to us pregame in regards to uh, Devin Booker's playmaking, he said, uh, you know, that he downloaded Chris Paul's brain during their time together. And I remember uh, when we had Chris on the pod two years ago, I think it was, yeah, two years ago, uh, we were talking about Book uh, off air, and he was like, oh, no, no, he's a sicko. Like, he, he's, he's obsessed, he's intelligent, uber competitive, uh, watches the game, studies the game. And again, it goes back to like, bet on those guys. Always bet on those guys. <laughs> Which brings me to quick point. Will Hardy said that about Keontae George. You know, he's like 19-year-old kid. Maybe he just turned 20. Just turned 20. 
goes home every night and watches League Pass. Studies the game. Loves watching film. Bet on those guys. Guys, always appreciate it. Love doing these Mondays together. We'll have a lot more next week. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having us. Fly Eagles fly. 